God, we honor you. This is the kind of stuff that God's about. You know, God's not about programs and buildings and lights and music and, and fancy this and fancy that. God's about people. Because that's where God's heart is. Because God loves his children. This morning we're continuing on with our lessons. Uh, Behold the Lamb of God. Again, still uh, behind a week. Uh, we're on the lesson 11 for August 11th. Uh, a new heart. Um, and that behold the Lamb, that's the, the hope we have uh, in Jesus Christ. You know, God came down in the form of a man and gave his life, shed his blood for us so that we would have a way to wash away sin, that perfect blood of Jesus Christ. And as the song says, there truly is power in, in the blood. Um, the focus thought this morning is I surrender my heart completely to God. The focus verse is Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Uh, lesson text is John 3, 1 through 8. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter in the, in the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot not tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. And then Second Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and you may be seated. <laughs> Last week we were talking about why we needed a pastor in our lives and, and that a good pastor is a, is a gift from God to his people. He's the, he's the shepherd, uh, he's the leader, he's the man of God for the people, for the time, for those people in that church. And why do we need a pastor? Why do we need someone that's responsible for our for our you know responsible for communicating God's ideas, God's plan of salvation to us. Why why do we need that? Why why is that needed? Why did God give us a pastor? And that's because we can't be trusted with that. I can't be trusted with my my own salvation because we allow things to come in between us and between God, and that's namely this old junk right here that's attached to my bones. Bring up 1 John 2:15 through 17, please. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. If you love the world, if you love the things in the world, the love of God then is not in you. It can't be in you because that's not God. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of lives, those things doesn't belong to God. The, the longing for the things that, uh, that the flesh and the, uh, the eyes want, the ca new cars and the homes and the fancy this and the little Debbie cakes that I like to eat so much, uh, the lusting of other humans, whatever it is, whatever our body lusts after, that's not of God. That's, that's of this flesh. To, uh, and there's so many examples in the Bible when we look at it about where we see where people have given in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. David and Bathsheba. David was considered a man after God's own heart. He was a repenter. He was a worshiper. But he watched the lady taking a bath from the top of the, the from the building. Next thing you know, he's committing for adultery with her. Next thing you know, he's committing murder. This is a man that was after God's own heart. Solomon uh, gave in to everything. He tried a little bit of everything that there was in the world. Samson, uh, King Hezekiah, even though he had lived for God his entire life, when God come and told him that, you know, your life's getting ready to, to end, he turned the wall to the wall, and because he loved his life so much, he said, God, you know how long I've lived for you. And so God came back and gave him 10 extra years. And then what happened? He allowed the enemy to come into the house to see all the blessings that he had. And he was happy. He was happy 
because he had peace in his time, but he wasn't concerned with that next generation. Uh, think about the pride of life and the, you know, the confidence that you have in yourself rather than having confidence in God. Think about King Saul. Think about Nebuchadnezzar and all the people that was in the Bible. All this stuff is not a God, and all that stuff that's in the world is going to pass away one day, but not God. Not the things of God. This building's going to go away. This flesh is going away. This clothes, everything that I worked so hard, my grass, my house, everything that I, I washed the house, I tore, took shutters down and painted them because they faded because, the, you know, we got to new the rise on them, make them look new, but they're really not new. But one of these days, it's going away from here. Every bit of this stuff, but not the stuff that's not in here. The, the, the part of me that's of God, the part of me that is eternal, my soul, it's not going away from here. It's going to last forever wherever it's going to go <laughs> wherever it's going to go so all that is in the world again will pass away but if we do the will of God will abide and will live forever Paul told the Philippians he said that you can you're allowed to work out your own salvation we talked about this last week Paul said work out your own salvation with fear and trembling and we talked about the first of that scripture he said as you obey the word that I'm preaching so he give them the leniency to work out their salvation but only as they were following the word of God that was being preached to them as long as they followed the word of God that was being preached to them he said you can work out your own salvation but you also got to have the fear, which is the reverential fear of God, as if I reverence my dad, I reverence my pastor, I reverence my boss, I reverence the police officer. And then I got to have the trembling fear of God. He's the judge. So I got to remember that not only is he's my savior, but he's my judge as well. So I've got to respect him, but also I got to be scared of him just like my dad. I not only reverence him as my dad, loved him with that, but I also knew that he had the belt. And he applied the belt whenever I needed the belt. And I got the belt sometimes. I told you all that a couple of weeks ago. So man can't be trusted with figuring out what their salvation is. Because that lies, because what lies at the center of man can't be trusted. Bring up Jeremiah 17 and 9. The heart is, a, is deceitful above all. All things, and we talked about that before. Oh, just trust your heart. Oh, just go with your heart. Do whatever it is that your heart wants to. No, don't do what your heart wants to do. Because the heart is deceitful. And it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? My heart is deceitful. It's an issue. We have an issue with the heart of man. There is an issue with us, not the physical muscle that pumps within the... And I might have some heart issues. I've had it checked before. It seems to be pretty good. But you never know. But, I'm, but, but it's the emotional, the, 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 the feelings, our spiritual essence, that part of the heart. Um, this thing in, that's beating inside of me, that's not what comes in between me and God. It's my emotions. It's my essence. Um, but these things can be skewed at times because I can feel like... I'm falling in love with, I can be married to my wife and love her, and then all of a sudden meet somebody at work. You know how it goes. And all of a sudden I feel like I'm in love with them. But th my heart's deceiving me because that's not love. All that is is physical and it's lust. That's the lust of the flesh. That's the lust of the eyes. That's all it. But my heart tells me, oh, but you love them. And your heart will deceive, deceive you when they tell you, oh, I love you. No, it's only just for a short matter of time. And then all of a sudden it's, it's gone. No real emotional attachment and that's because sin corrupted our heart we got heart disease we've got disease of the heart when God created man and woman he placed them in the garden and they were completely innocent even though they were not clothed it didn't bother them they walked around with no clothes it didn't bother them because they didn't know any better because they didn't know what sin was they had no idea they were ignorant to them and that's what made them free from sin because they didn't know it and so they couldn't willfully commit Sin. So that was what, again, made them free from it. But then Eve started talking with the devil. And he got into her ear. And, and, and you got to be careful who you allow in your ear. you got to be a, a careful who you allow to speak to yourself. You need to be careful who you allow in the ears of your family. You need to be careful who you allow in your house to talk to you and to your family and who you hang around and who you're listening to because the more you allow them into your head, it goes into your head and then it goes from your heart and then after it starts getting into your heart, it can start causing problems and then you can start questioning God and you can start questioning things. And I talked about the bitter and the sweet last week. We don't, mind, we don't question the sweet things. 
things of God. Oh, we want the blessings of God. We want the good stuff. But when it comes to the bitter, the hard stuff, that when it gets down in your stomach, it don't feel so good. Like, don't sin, don't commit fornication, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat. Uh, sometimes people don't like that stuff. That, that's a little bitter because we want to do what we want to do. And we're the great justifiers. We're a, we have the ability to justify anything it is. And I can grab one scripture and I can justify about anything I want to do. But when I eat the whole book, and it gets bitter in my belly. It gets a little. It tastes real sweet at the beginning of it. But so then we begin to question God. And we begin to question things in our mind. And when we don't know why and we don't know how and we don't know where, we don't need to look to the world and we don't need to look to our heart. We need to look to the Word. When I don't know how I'm going, this is going to happen and I don't know where the help from God's going to come from when I look to here I got hope I've got peace I get joy from here because I know I, and I need to hear that uh, that I can trust in him and I need to hear that I can contr- trust God and I need to listen to Job when he says though he slays me yet will I trust him Though he slay me, I'm still, I don't need to listen to the words of the enemy. I don't be, need to be letting him get inside of my ears. So the devil started talking to her about eating from the, the, eating from the tree. You know the whole story. You know, don't touch the wet paint. Don't get your hands in the cookie jar. And you're not going to die. You know, it's going to be okay. It's going to taste delicious. And your eyes are going to be open. And you're going to be like the gods. And you're going to know the difference between good and evil. And why would she want to know that? <laughs> If you didn't know what it was, why? because in their instance, ignorance was bliss. I mean, it was great. That's what made them innocent. That made them free from sin and from guilt is because they didn't know what it was. When you're not, if you, Brother John, he, yeah, there he is. He's driving down the road yesterday. We're going to go do kayaks, and he's just doing Highland Road. Is that what it is? You know, y'all know the speed trap in Highland Road in between uh, uh, the fairgrounds and over on to whatever that other road is. Uh, uh, 11, over at 11, that's what it is. And so, it, you know, it goes from 40 to 25, and he's just doing 40 miles an hour, and the cop pulls him behind him riding, and he's not paying no attention, you know, and all of a sudden the lights come on. He's like, what did I do wrong? Because he was ignorant to it. And luckily the, the, the police officer let you off, didn't The blessings of the Lord because of ignorance. The, the officer said, well, I'm going to let you off. Now, he didn't have to, but he did. Thank the Lord for that. But so ignorance is, so why would they want to know? Why would they want to know that? And the devil didn't tell her the whole story, did he? He told her, yes, you're going to be like the gods. You're going to know the difference between good and evil. But he didn't tell them that there comes consequences when you know the difference between good and evil. If John would have said, well, officer, I knew the speed limit was 25, but I don't care. I'm doing 40 because that's what I want to do. It's 40. I'm a taxpayer. I can go as fast as I want to. The officer would have rode him up. I'm pretty sure that he would have rode him up just as quick as he could. Probably would have carted you off to jail, maybe, Brother John. Because we're held accountable for the things that we know, the things that we do. She took a bite, it, uh, offered it to her husband. He willfully took a bite. And all of a sudden, their eyes are open. Oh, we're naked. When did that happen? I didn't know it. We're, what happened? You know, can you imagine all of a sudden they didn't know they didn't have clothes on, and all of a sudden they take a bite, and all of a sudden, and you know what happened? They started feeling guilty. The conscience that God places inside a man began to all of a sudden, I feel guilty. And then when they feel guilty, what did they do? They hid from God. The moment that they begin to feel guilty, the heart disease began to set in. And that's how God knew. He looked at them and he started looking. All the other times God came to do a, a walk in the garden, he was doing heart checks. And looks like your heart's doing pretty good. You're not feeling guilty about anything. Everything must be great. And then all of a sudden, they come, he comes in. Where's Adam? Where's Eve? I can't find them today. Where are they at? Where, where are they? And they're hiding from God. And then all of a, God, all of a sudden, God says, now I know what's going on now. They got that dreaded heart disease. All of a sudden, here it is, their conscience, and all of a sudden, they're feeling bad, and they begin to feel guilty, and all the guilt wells up, and they begin to hide from God. So God had to do what? He had to do a sacrifice for them. He had to kill an animal so that they could have some clothes. And then, he, you know what he did after that? He escorted them out of the garden. Because sin has consequences. There are consequences. Even though they felt guilty, they probably felt sorry. They probably felt bad about it. But because they had sin now in the life, out of the garden. That's it. You can get forgiveness, but there's still scars. 
There are still scars. Doctors can go in and they can look at people and they can see, you may never know you've had a heart attack. You may have never known you've had problems. But the doctors can go in there and they can look because there's scars in there. They know mm, that you've had some problems there. You've had some issues. And that doesn't mean that you can't live happily ever after and have a great life, but things will never be the same. And things were never the same for, for Adam and Eve after that. That sin that, and not just Adam and Eve, but for all of us. Every one of us. Bring up Romans 5 and 12. Wherefore, as by one man centered into the world, I've never done anything wrong in my life. I'm a good person. I'm a good guy. There's nothing wrong. I'm not, I'm not bad. And sitting by death, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all for. For that all have sinned. From the fact, very fact that we were born and we got, we got blood in us from Adam and Eve, I got sin in my life. That's the word of God. If I'm going to believe, if I'm going to believe God for healing, if I'm going to believe God for salvation, I've got to believe God. i got to believe the word of God for that. I've got to take the bitter with the sweet. If I want all the benefits from God, I've got to take all the other things with God. So now that heart disease is hereditary. It goes from person to person to person. Do you have to teach your kids how to have a conscience to feel guilty? Has anybody ever sat down, now, little Johnny, you need to feel guilty about what you did when they first do it? Because all you got to do is the moment they get their hand in the cookie jar, when they know they weren't supposed to get into the cookie jar, the moment they get that in there, they start feeling guilty, especially when you see them. Some of the earliest memories I have in my mind is when I remember hiding from mom for doing something. I don't even remember. That's the thing about it, is I don't even remember what I did, but I remember the guilt from it. Amen. Isn't that horrible? You don't remember the good that you got out of that cookie jar. I don't remember, but man, I sure remember all the guilt. that, And I, got, I remember the punishment, but what good was the good that I got out of it? I don't remember that. I was only age four at the very most. But mom and dad never taught, sat me down and taught me how to feel guilty. Because that's the conscience. That's the sin that's inside of us. It's automatically there. I automatically feel guilty when I do something that I know that I'm not supposed to do. Some people, eventually as they get older, they override that stuff. They are able to wipe over top of them. They wipe their mouths and they keep on going and it don't bother them. But while you're younger, you got that stuff in you. And I, I had, a, I had a, my fair share of it. I had a, a real good dose of it. But that's what Satan wanted us to do. That's, Satan wanted us to feel guilty. He wanted us to feel bad. He wanted us to feel like you're nothing. You're scum. You're, you know, God created you. God loved you. He came down. He died. He shed his blood for your salvation. And look what you've done. You have failed him. I want you to feel horrible about that. He wants you to think about that failure more than you remember the grace of God, the mercies of God, the love of God. And if he can get you feeling bad and get you feeling guilty, the next thing you're doing is, I'm hiding from God. I, I want to hide from God. And he wants you to forget, I got the, every, my, his mercies are new every morning. Every day that I roll out of bed, the mercies of God are new or are not available to me. The devil, the enemy does not want you to remember that. He does not want, he wants you to think about, oh, you messed up, you goofed up, you done this. But God wants you to remember, and God wants you to remember, and he wants you to know every day. That's why it's in the Bible. That's why you go into here. Mercy's new every morning. His grace, his love, it's everlasting. He'll never fail you. He'll never leave you. All the way up until the end of the world, he'll, go, he'll walk with you. I got lots of failures that I remember up in here because of the guilt. And I got to go searching for the mercy. I got to physically, I, the, the failures that I have done and the times that I've messed up on God, they come before me. This, the, the enemy pounds them into my head day after day after day. And I have to force myself to remember the mercies and the grace of God. I've got to go into the Word and i got to study. And I said, Dwayne, I know. Dwayne, you know you messed up. But the mercies and grace of God overrule that. That trumps that. The blood, it overrules. It overshadows every bit of that I've constantly all the time we have the enemy he's, be careful who you let in your ears be careful you don't sit there and commune around sit there and talk with the devil the minute he's talking with you grab the word of God grab you a song grab something other start worshiping God do whatever it is that you can to get that knocked out of there get him out of there Thank the Lord. And I appreciate the Lord that we have such a giving spirit that God has blessed us with that. Because you can't outgive God. You might give, but God just gives right back. Press down, shaking together. 
running over. So the enemy wants you to feel guilty. He wanted all of Adam and Eve's ancestors to feel guilty. But God doesn't want us to feel guilty. God wants us to remember his mercy. God wants us to remember his grace. So what do we do about heart disease? What do we do about it? Bring up Romans 7, 23 and 24. But I see another law in my members, warn against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul sitting there saying, dude, there's something inside of me that's worn. It's that, it's that law. God had to lay the law down to man. After, after he, God has to put guardrails in our lives. You know why we have guardrails on the interstate? Do you know why there are guardrails? It's to keep you from going over the edge and dying. God has to place guardrails. He has to place the law in our lives to keep us from going. It's a guardrail. It's for our own protection. God does that. And Paul said, man, as I think about the law and I think about all that stuff, it reminds me about how much guilt I have and it makes me feel guilty. Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this? Who's going to get rid of this? I want rid of this guilty feeling. I want rid of this... Because I see the law and I see how much I've messed up and I see I have not lived a life that's pleasing to God. How am I going to get rid of this? Bring up 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, I the law of sin. But I have to do it through Jesus Christ by tapping in to the blood that washes, that this doesn't cover sin, but it washes away all of the sin. In the Old Testament, it covered that's all it did. The blood of the sheep and goats, it could only cover it. It'd be like saying, I got my body dirty. I throw a shirt. I get the shirt dirty. I throw another shirt on top of that. I get that shirt dirty. I throw another shirt on that. I get that shirt dirty. I throw another shirt on top of that. And eventually, I'm walking around like this, and I can't get around no more because I've got so much covering over me. But Jesus is like taking a bath. I, got, I get to wash all that stuff away. It goes down to the drain. It hits the river. It goes down to the new river. It gets washed out into the ocean. And I never see it again. That's the power of the blood. Bring up Revelations 1 and 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. By applying the blood of Jesus Christ to our life, our sins are just, it's washed away. They're, it's, it's completely gone. I'm free. I, 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 I'm, I'm no longer attached to that stuff. We get a new heart then. That's why I need, when I repent and I get baptized in Jesus' name, I get, an, I get the ability, I get all that sin washed away and my heart disease is gone. It's all washed out and I'm getting it all cleaned up in there. And when I get that, then I need the Holy Ghost. Because once I get that new heart, I got a hole in there. I got, I got a hole inside of me. That once I get rid of the old man, before I get the new heart, once I get rid of the old man, I got to get the new heart. I get a hole inside of there. And if I don't replace it with something, you're in trouble. Bring up Luke 11, 24, 26. And when the unclean spirit is gone out of man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He said, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it cleaned up, swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh seven others, spirits more wicked than him, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse. than that person that repents and gets baptized, but they don't change their life. They don't get that new man. They don't get that new heart, but they continue on doing the same old thing over and over and over and over. You know what that is? You just open up that hole. God, God gave me a dream this morning, and I wished it, I could say it was a vision. Because the Bible says he gives old men dreams and he gives young men visions. And I want visions and I don't want dreams because I want to be a young man. But I had a dream and I must be an old man and that makes me mad. I was like, Lord, give me visions, please. But I had a dream and he woke me up at 4 o'clock this morning. And it was the dream. I, I, I'm not going to talk about what the dream was, but it was basically, and I ain't telling who it was. But the, uh, the basis of it was combining the thought that I had earlier about being careful who's in your ear and this one right here. It was combined. If you allow someone that has gotten God in their life, but they played around on God, 
that you allow them in your ear and you allow them in your home and you allow them around your kids, you're inviting spirits into your house. You're inviting whatever it was that was on you earlier or that person earlier and seven more to come in there. You want a spirit of adultery? You want a spirit of fornication? A lying spirit? A cheating spirit? A prejudiced spirit? A spirit of hate? You want that? You want that on your kids? You Be careful who you let in your, in your ear. Be careful who you let into your house. Be careful who you hang around with. I know we're supposed to be lights and witnesses to all the world. I know we're supposed But you better be careful who you call your friend and who you hang around with. You better be careful because I'm the man of my house. I am, I, 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 I am the protector of my home. And I will be careful who my kids hang out with. I, they're 20 and 21, 22, whatever. And I'm still. Y'all need to watch who you hang out with, y'all. I, I, I still ain't scared to do that. You run the risk of getting a spirit inside y'all. So anyway, back to the subject. That person that's repented, that's been washed, needs that hole filled up. They get the Holy Ghost. But, you, but, it, but once you get the Holy Ghost, once you get that new heart, you've got to keep it. <laughs> You got to keep that heart clean. You can't you, you can't lose it because if you lose it, that hole begins to reopen. And once you have that new heart, you're no longer held captive. You know, we was talking about Paul was talking about. He says, "I'm I'm, I'm held captive. I'm I'm fighting. I'm fighting with this war and and in my in my body, and I'm held captive. This and then I go thank God through Jesus Christ that I have the ability to do it. So then, what happens in Romans eight and one? After he gets that, he says, "Now there's therefore no condemnation." I don't have that guilty feeling anymore through Jesus Christ. I don't have to feel the guilt. But it's to those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I can continue walking after the flesh, but then there's condemnation. But if I walk after the Spirit, I don't have to have condemnation. If, I'm following, if I've got the new man inside of me, and I've got the Spirit inside of me, and I'm walking and leading, being led by the Spirit, I don't have to feel guilty no more. If I'm doing what the Spirit wants me to do, if I'm allowing God to be not my co-pilot, but allowing Him to be the pilot, and I just sit back in life and say, God, you drive it, and I'll follow it. Those that are in Christ no longer have to have the condemnation because they are that new person. But those that repent, baptize, but still don't change, they're still walking after the flesh, you still got condemnation. You still got guilt. You still got, you've still got all this stuff on you. We don't have to, but if we're following the Spirit, I don't have to run and hide anymore. I don't have to be like Adam and Eve when God's presence come in. I've got to, oh God, I remember what I did last week. I, now, that don't mean we ain't going to make mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. I promise you, I, I make mistakes. We're going to make them. But I got an advocate. Bring, bring, bring up 1 John 3 and 24. Uh, well, that's where he took it by. I'm sorry. He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and thereby we know that he abideth in us. By the Spirit which He has given to us. So we know that He, he abides with us. But um, actually, I think I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. Or I missed something. So anyway, we'll go on. So He abides inside of us, the Spirit inside of us. Sorry about that. Um, the, the song says, Rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way for the Comforter abides in me. He rides in me. So His mercies again, new every day. And I don't have to hide from Him again. I don't have to hide from him. I, I, I can get to. I can walk in the. I can walk in the spirit. I can walk. I can bask in the glow of his mercies. I can bask in the glows of his grace, and I can accept the mercies and grace. And I am that new person again. That doesn't give me the license to sin and do whatever it is that I want to do, but the spirit comes in and it gives me the ability to do the things that I've never been able to do before. It gives me when God called. What time is it? It's not too far. When God called King Saul uh, to be king, he was a man that didn't want to be in the spotlight. He didn't want to. He didn't want to to, to be all this stuff. He, he, you know, he was out looking for his dad's donkeys. That's what he was doing. He didn't want. He didn't want to be something other. So Samuel told God, but when he came to Samuel to say, Brother Davis preached on it the other night. When uh, he came to Samuel and say, Hey, the, here's the seer. Maybe he can help us find the donkeys. He comes up to him and God says, That's the man I want to be king. Bring up First Samuel ten six and seven. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And this is Samuel talking to Saul. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt pro prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. Then seven. And let it be when these signs are coming to thee, that thou do, a, do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. So he's telling him that you're going to become a new man. 
And that's what happens when the Spirit of God comes inside us. We become that new person. He was not here, again, chicken old Saul. He, he, he was just a chicken. He didn't, you know, he wanted to be about finding his dad's donkeys. He didn't want to be about doing anything else. But whatever it was that the man of God prophesied to him, bring up uh, 1 Samuel 10, 9 through 11, it came, for, it came to pass. And the Spirit of God... Uh, yeah, 9, and, uh, 9 through 11, sorry. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. God gave him a transplant. God gave him, and all these signs came to pass that day, then 11. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass that all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said unto one another, What is this that is come unto the... What's happened to this son of Kish? What in the world's gotten into this guy? You know, when somebody gets a chance... When they become the new man, not only do they repent, they get baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, but they decide, I'm going to walk the right way. I'm going to follow after the Spirit. Then people start saying, what's gotten into that Dwayne? All of a sudden, he's changing. He's not talking like he used to. He don't go to the same places. He don't hang out with the same people. He's come, what in the world's gotten into this? Is, is he among those prophets? And then the next thing you know, here's a regular old king, a regular old boy that was looking for his daddy's donkeys, and all of a sudden, he's anointed to be king. And then when the, 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 the inhabitants of Gibeah, after he's anointed, the, the inhabitants of Gibeah come up and they're threatened. And they tell Saul what's getting ready to go on. Bring up 1 Samuel 11, 6 and 7. And the Spirit came upon Saul after he had the new heart. After the Spirit came upon him, the Spirit of God came upon Saul. And when he heard the tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen, hewed them in pieces, set them throughout the coast of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out, uh, and they came out with one cons uh, consent. So he got the new heart. And so when God changes us, God can make you, and we talked about before about being the, 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 the piece of clay. God has the ability to make you into what he wants you to be. You have the ability to do things that you never thought you before because you're not that same old person that you were. You have the ability, you, you may think that I, 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 after you get saved and you turn, I, I, I'm nothing, I, I just can't do anything. Huh? No, you, yes, you can. You can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens you. I can do anything. You may not think God can make you into a teacher. God can make you into a preacher. He can make you into a musician. I, I, I never thought I'd ever play an instrument, never in my whole life. Then when I gave my life to God, when I decided in 8th, ninth grade, whenever it was, I'm walking for God. Next thing you know, I'm picking up an instrument. Next thing you know, I'm picking up another instrument. Whatever it is that God needed, and I said, God, I'll do whatever it is that you want me to do. I'll be willing, God, if you need a guitar player, I'll play the guitar. When Darren left and we needed a bass player, God, you need a bass player, I'll play the bass. I'll do whatever it is that God, God, you need a teacher, I'll be a teacher. God, you need a, a prayer warrior, God, I'll be a prayer warrior. God, you need somebody to intercede, God, I'll intercede. You need a preacher? Did anybody ever think when, when Jeff Hogue came here that he'd be a pastor? Did anybody, anybody in your right mind thought that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Jeff O, did you think he was going to be a pastor? He came in here to get a girl. <laughs> That's the only reason he showed up, wasn't it, brother? To get your daughter, brother John. That was all. But God got him. And when God got him and then he got God, then he got God what God wanted for him. And God said, I will make that boy a pastor. He may not think he can, but through me, he can. All because he got a new heart. He got a heart transplant. He got a completely new heart from God. And so you got to keep that new heart new. You have to keep it fresh. You have to keep it clean. Because it's possible for heart disease to creep back in from time to time. I've seen same people. You talk about, here's Brother Jeff. No interest in church. Interested in girl. Coming in. Pastor of a church. I've seen people come in. Interested in church, interested in God, I'm going to start a church. Next thing you know, they don't even know what church is anymore. They don't ever go, they don't serve God or nothing. And you can write that up to, to youth if you want to, but that's writing up to the flesh. Write that up to the flesh because they 
didn't really change inside of them. They got all kinds of great ideas, but the, the, they didn't want to change. And that's what happened to King Saul. One day he's the king. One day he's got the Spirit of the Lord moving on him. One day he's, he's slicing the oxen up, and he's calling the people to war, and he's out leading them. And the next minute, because of disobedience... And because of the pride of life, because he thought he could say what was right, and he could say what was wrong, and he didn't have to follow what the law of God was. Next thing, it's not the Spirit of the Lord that's moving on him. It's an evil spirit that's moving on him, and then he's trying to kill the anointed of God. He's trying to kill David by throwing the javelin at him. And that tells me, yes, I can get a new heart. That tells me I can get saved, but I have to keep, it's my responsibility to keep it clean. It's my responsibility to make sure it's kept right. A new heart brings a new conscience. Again, I can make mistakes, but I can get forgiveness of them. But I can't treat that new heart any way that I want to. Amen. Brother Steve, you know about strokes, don't you? Now, don't you? You know about how important it is, is it now to treat a stroke as quickly as you can? It's pretty important, ain't it? Brother Kirk Ike in Richmond just had one a couple weeks ago. Just so happened, and it ain't just so happened because it was the Lord. Him and his wife have been talking about combining their offices at home because uh, he's got a contracted business. She's a realtor. So they decided they was going to make their office together at home, and they was going to be in the, same, in the same room. And it just so happens one day she asks him a question, and he doesn't respond. And she asks him again, and he don't respond. And he's looking outside, and he's sitting there grabbing at the blinds and stuff, and he's jerking them off the wall because he can't talk. He can't. She realizes he's having a stroke. i got to do something right then. It's imperative. The quicker you react to a stroke, the more chance they have of the damage being reversible. She was able to get that to him and to get him to help. So sin, if you just leave sin alone, bring up 1 John 1 and 14 and 15. For sure. I may have skipped something, brother, uh, brother JB. Yeah, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it's finished. If you don't treat it, if you don't treat it right away, and you don't do something wrong, you leave sin alone, even though you got that clean heart, even though I've repented, even though I'm trying, if I allow something to creep back into my life, and I allow it to set up shop in my life and stay in there, sin, once it comes forth and you, I leave it there, sin brings forth death. And there is no sin making it up in the heaven. That's in the Word of God. I didn't write that. But if I repent, John said, uh, uh, first John said, uh, two and one, bring that up right quick, and I'm going to close because the kids are back there. If I, if I, if I, if I sin, I said repent. Uh, love, no, two and one, sorry, JB. I'm going to slow down a little bit. Calm down, Dwayne, calm down. First John, two and one, I gave you two and 15, I know. I, I wrote it down wrong. My little, chi my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin... He hath an, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. I have somebody that comes in, that steps in for me. Hey, but I got to go to him. I still have to go to him. I still have to turn to him. The kids are back there. Uh, Paul talked about. Uh, I'm not going to get into that because it's going to take too long. As the kids are back there, I go out. I need a heart transplant. I get me a heart transplant. I got a brand new heart. Somebody else's heart's not brand new. Somebody else's. But I got a heart that's better than what, evidently the one I have. I have a responsibility to take care of that heart, don't I? Now, if I go off smoking, drinking, doing drugs, doing whatever else, and I put the wear and tear on that heart, what good was it? What good is that, that new heart going to do for me? It's not going to do any good at all. I have a responsibility to exercise, and that's what I was talking about where Paul, I'm going to read it anyway. I'm sorry. Bring up Acts 24, go through 14 through 16, and this, I promise I'm done. Um, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law, of the prophet, the law and the prophets. Hang on. Paul said, I worship what you call heresy. The way that you call heresy, that's the way I worship. I, this is what I do. And have, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead. He said, I've got hope. And he said, and also those people that worship the way I do, that they have the same hope that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Everybody, whether you're, you're, you're going, you're going to find out where you're going. You're either going to go when Jesus calls or you're going to come up a little bit later. But all, everybody's going to live again one day. You're either going to die forever or live forever. But then Paul said, I, herein do I exercise my... 
we're supposed to exercise. Paul said, bodily exercise profiteth little. It does a little. It gets rid of this. But it does very little. It helps the body, but it doesn't help eternity. But Paul says, I exercise myself to have always a conscience that's void of offense toward God and toward man. He said, I am constantly, I got my new heart, and I'm not abusing it now. I'm not going to go out and do drugs. I'm not going to go drink. I'm, I'm exercising my heart. I'm praying. I'm fasting. I'm studying. I'm trying to follow after the Spirit so that I can have a conscience that's void from my offense toward God. I'm constantly exercising. I'm constantly working on myself trying to bring discipline into my life. That's why fasting is so important because it, I know it's hard. I know it's tough when you're in the middle of the night and you're supposed to be fasting and little Debbie's calling your name from the cupboard. And I get up and I don't remember I'm fasting. and I'm climbing to, I've been there and I've done that before. More than times than I'd like to say. Quite, not quite often. I tell Brenda don't buy them anymore and I won't eat them. So. Okay, okay. You've heard this, the rumbling of the paperwork. Okay, so. But anyway, David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. God has the ability to create in us a new heart if we give our lives to him. But it's our responsibility to keep it right before him. So constantly ask God, Create in me that God, clean, heart, clean heart, Lord, and constantly renew that right spirit, Pastor. <laughs> Give the Lord a big hand. Praise the Lord.